Hey, good morning, Tracy. Uh, let me get the hey, Sean. How are you? Doing okay. I am slightly behind this morning. Let me get the host key. <laughs> That's okay. I was just like uh, looking at an invite that I got and I was like, is this the right day? Time? Okay, good. What, what, uh, <laughs> what, is, what is time over the holidays? I know. I know. Well, it's, it's actually the first day of my time off. So I was like, what day did they schedule this? Nice. <laughs> Um, all right, <laughs> okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the December 7th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Um, but we do have a few, I think, new people on the call. Uh, so just to, to remind everybody. We have two things that we have to abide by. The first is the antitrust policy notice that is currently displayed on the screen. Uh, so there are a number of people here from different organizations and we need to make sure that we are not participating in any activities that are prohibited under any of the antitrust and competition laws across the world. The second thing uh, that we have to abide by is our code of conduct. Uh, everyone is welcome here, but we do have to abide by the code of conduct, which basically says to be respectful of others uh, on the call, their ideas and opinions. Um, and of course, the code of conduct is linked in the agenda. For announcements today, we have uh, the standard announcement of the Hyperledger Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter that goes out each Friday. If you do want to include something in that newsletter, please do uh, leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. The second announcement that we have is that we are canceling the TOC meetings for the 21st, 28th, and January 4th. Uh, we will, we are planning a meeting next week uh, still. So um, the existing TOC is still responsible for today's call and next week's call. And the new TOC will be responsible starting at the beginning of the year on the, I guess that would be the 11th of January. So um, just for everybody's information, um, hopefully that's helpful. Um, but we do obviously welcome the, the newly elected TOC members to this week's call and next week's call. Uh, so you can get a general idea of how these meetings are run and um, of course, if there's any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Are there any other announcements that anybody would like to make? No, okay. Uh, so we do have two quarterly reports. They are quite old, uh, Bevel and Solang. I think we've only had five people, at least the last time I looked, who reviewed these two reports. Uh, so if you haven't looked at these reports yet, um, please do so that we can get these merged. I think we said that we would need to have at least 50% uh, of the TOC members taking a look at it before we could review or uh, before we could merge. So um, please, please, please uh, make sure you take care of that as maybe um, potentially one of your last items before uh this term ends so that we can get those merged we do have two reports oh uh before we get there i didn't see any questions on bevel or solang but are there any questions that anybody has on those reports that we should make sure we get back to the the uh maintainers on Okay, uh, so we do have two past due reports. Uh, we have the Transact report that was due November 23rd. Uh, this is a dormant project. We have not received a quarterly report at all in 2023. Um, so I have this question here about whether we should uh, move this project to end of life. So I would love to hear some thoughts on and opinions on this particular item. P. 
Peter? I just wanted to ask if, if anyone knows or remembers what was the latest communication from the maintainers. Because I, I forgot, sorry. Yeah, Aru, do you, I think you may have been the last one to communicate. Do you remember when we last communicated with them? Right, so um, last time when I reached out to the maintainers and then the, the conversation is on Discord, um, Transact maintainers channel, they wanted some more time uh, to be in the dormant state. And I guess it makes sense that we again reach out and see if and, and call out that as per the timelines, it's been dormant for a while and ask them if we will need to move this to end of life. Um, they were waiting to move some of the code base to Sawtooth sort of library before moving that into a deprecation state. Right. Um... Yeah, I just, I figure since we haven't heard from them in a year, it might be worthwhile that this actually does move out of dormant. Um, but uh, yeah, Arun, I guess if you can reach out to them. Um, although this may become uh, a non-issue, a non if we do adopt Arno's new project lifecycle, because it would become an archived project, because my expectation is that if we adopt Arno's simplified life cycle than anything that's currently in dormant um, end of life and deprecate it would go to an archive state. So Arno, is that what you were thinking? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so it very well may become which, a, a non which, point. <laughs> which is let, less lethal because you can resurrect from archival and like end of life sounds pretty <laughs> and reversible, irreversible. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, and then the the second uh, report this past due is Cello. It was due last week. I have seen movement on the issue uh, that has been put into the Cello um, GitHub repo. So I I know they're working on it, um, but we haven't yet received it. So my expectation is that it will show up shortly. Um, and we'll just keep an eye on, on that and make sure that it doesn't become too overdue, if you will. Any other comments on the past due reports? Okay. Uh, so upcoming reports today, we do have do the Basu, Caliper, and Firefly. Uh, so we will check and uh, see if those do show up today. Um, please do be on the lookout for those so that you can review those when they do come in. And um, yeah, that's it for the, the project reports. Any questions, comments? Okay. Uh, for discussion items today, I had completely forgot to add the lifecycle simplification to uh, the list. I did do that this morning. I think that's important for us to discuss. Um, Dave's going to take us through the Hyperledger Fabric ecosystem. And if we still have time remaining, we will get to this TOC 2023 re retrospective. Um, and if not this week, we'll definitely get to it next week. Um, so let's start with the lifecycle simplification. Um, that is not it. <laughs> All right, um, so I think maybe just to make this easy, uh, this is probably the, the place that we want to take a look. So Arno, did you want to talk to us about this? Sure, I mean, this is the, the easiest way to look at this. I think this image says it all in a way. So, you know, it occurred to me the other day and I brought that up, I said, well, a life cycle is really complicated. And I believe, you know, every time we had a special case, we felt like, oh, we need to add a state to handle this. And so this is why we end up with these things fairly complex. And in fact, you know, based on experience I have, I have with other organizations, I realized, you know, part of this has to do with this, what I was just talking about earlier, which is end of life 
is really terminal. There is no recovery. <laughs> uh, and so instead, a lot of other foundations use as, you know, the normal final state archived, which has the nice characteristic of being reversible. So there may be cases where you say, well, you know what, we want to unarchive this and, you know, and so I think that removes a lot of the fear of moving things to end of life, you know, uh, Instead, we can be a bit more casual and it, because it's not as lethal as I was saying earlier. So essentially, it simplifies a lot the, the, the life cycle. As uh, Tracy was saying, basically, we collapse dormant, deprecated, and end of life into this new state called archived. And uh, so there are different circumstances under which we, you know, all of the things that made us move to dormant, deprecated line of life now falls into what, you know, makes us move to uh, move a project to archived. And at the same time, we have the possibility if somebody wants to and applies for it to, re to revive a, an archive project. Similar to what we said before with dormant, if you resurrect from archived, you go back to incubation, whether you were graduated or not before. And, um, and that's pretty much it. So in all, you know, fairness, I, I do want to point out that deprecated, you know, was introduced with this idea that this is a plan end of life kind of thing where we said, hey, we are not going to keep maintaining this, maintaining this technology. There's other ways you should do this. And it was a strong way of signaling to the community, don't rely on this. You need to figure out a transition plan out of the, off of this technology. In this case, we lose a little bit of this because it's not built into it that, well, if that's what you want, before archiving the project, you should really have your own kind of deprecation process where Essentially, I would expect a project to publish on their readme, you know, watch out, we are about to archive this project. And, and all the things that were done as part of the deprecation, they would be handled as a pre-archival process. And of course, the talk can decide to do this. I also softened a little bit, if you go into the details, just to highlight one key difference also was a bit trying to anticipate you know, I, I said should rather than must kind of thing, at least in one place I can't remember right now, but what I wanted to, to handle is, you know, there are things, a lot of the current process kind of expect people to be there and be able to act according to the process. And in fact, I wanted to allow for the possibility that, well, maybe all the maintainers are gone and we can't even ask them to do whatever, you know, to keep maintaining a project for a while or anything. And, and we see that, right? I mean, in the case of Transact, for instance, it's hard to know what's going on and so on. So the talk may just have to bite the bullet and, and move things to archive. And so the, the language has changed a little bit in that regard to try to say, yeah, if possible, we will do those things. But, you know, we... The, the process allows for other ways in case a more radical approach you know, is necessary. That's really what it's all about. Great. Rama? Uh, thanks, Tracy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've had this discussion about uh, simplifying the uh, life cycle diagram since we started working on the life cycle and badging task force. So, thanks, Arno, for putting the diagram together. Just a couple of questions uh, or a couple of uh, comments. Uh, in the, uh, I had I'd made a separate diagram. If you look at the uh, the file I created and in the wiki as well, I had added an arrow from graduated back to incubation, which was a means of uh, telling a project that they have a graduate project that they have slipped in the standards and maybe they should you know uh, try to reacquire the graduation graduation credentials. So. That that is one uh, thing we can might want to add. If uh, let's discuss that. Another thing, uh, I just wonder if uh, 
graduated to archive, uh, if we just have a direct transition, if that's not too drastic. I mean, archived has a specific connotation in GitHub projects, right? It means that your uh, code base becomes read only. And it means if anybody looks at an archived project, uh, they might think that this project is not necessarily worth using anymore. They should go and look somewhere else, which may not be the case for a project, which let's say still has much to offer people, but uh, it's just that the developers have been inactive for a while, um, you know, which would reflect the dormant state. So uh, maybe we could consider having just one state between graduate and archive. I don't know what we call it though. So for your first uh, point, I did ask the same question about can a project move back from graduated back to incubated, right? Because I knew that we had discussed that in the project um, project lifecycle badging task force. Um, I also think that uh, one of the things that we've introduced this past year is the project annual review. Um, and during that annual review, um, part of that is supposed to take a look at what is the right state of the project, right? This is something that the governing board actually asked for the, the TOC to make sure was part of that project um, annual review is ensuring that the correct state is reflected in the, um, or for the project. So I, I am in agreement, I think, with potentially adding an arrow that goes from graduated back to incubated um so i don't i don't know what other thoughts are let's start with that particular question then we'll move on to your second question rama thanks so just to uh, quickly respond on about the state of the project i think um, if we do uh, if you are disciplined about issuing badges and uh, reviewing the criteria then uh, the set of badges the project has should automatically slot it into one of these states right that's what we've been discussing these past few months yeah. Others thoughts on that? Yeah, so I understand that why you asked this, uh, Tracy. And I, you know, you asked, what about this? And I didn't know what you meant. This, so that's why I say, well, right. Yeah, yeah. In the proposal, it doesn't say that would happen, but I, I can see how that could be useful indeed. Okay. Marcus? Now, I was wondering, I mean, how often uh, did this happen in the past that we had a graduated project which then fall back to incubation mode and then did a, a few of those cycles? Did this ever happen? Uh, we haven't allowed that to happen. Um, it probably should have happened for some of our projects, but it has never happened because it wasn't an option, right? If you look at this, it was always a forward, forward okay, so movement but, in the life cycle. But, but, Okay, then let me re-ask the question slightly differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, did we ever have the situation where a project went to uh, from graduated to dormant, then back to incubation, and then back to graduated? We've never had a project uh, re or, or to have a comeback from dormant. Okay, so, so, um... so I mean, maybe this is then just a, a corner case, which is as we, I mean, as you identified in also Rama as well, is not really well reflected in the new life cycle. However, if this is really the case, I mean, you can always go to archives and then directly into incubation, right? Without making the graph uh, more complicated than it actually should be for this corner case, right? Uh, I'm... Go ahead, Arno. I, I think that's the question, you know, is the motivation here for the talk to be able to really act in such a way that we're going to do a review of all the project and there may be graduated project. We say, you know what, you're not archivable, you know, you're not being archived yet, but we definitely don't think you qualify as a graduated project anymore. We're going to degrade uh, to, you know, uh, demote you to incubation. I don't know that. Is that what you say that the board wants us to do? Yeah, so the, the board, what the board wants is for projects to be accurately reflected as to the state that they're in, right? Um, you know, I think before we had, instead of graduated, we had active right here yeah. um, because, you know, what we were trying to reflect is that, you know, it was a one-time event, you graduated, of course, you can't ever ungraduate, if you will. 
Um, so, you know, potentially this is the wrong name if we're going to have this ability to move backwards um, in the life cycle, which we haven't had before. But I do think that it is part of this annual review life cycle to make sure that uh, projects ref are statuses of projects are reflective of what they actually are so that people know, um, you know, do we still have three unique organizations that are supporting this project or ha have we gone um, backwards in that? And so we should really move it back to what is an incubation state where we're looking for more people to come and participate. Because I think part of the reason that we have these states of dormant and end of life is because we know that the project is starting to uh, lose interest from the existing maintainers, right? Because they've moved on to something else uh, or whatever the case may be. And what we're really looking for is for this backward to incubation to actually happen because we're looking for more people to come in and support that project. Um, you know, if you think about this uh, status of uh, Hyperledger Explorer, right? It went to an end of life. It came back as a lab. Um, you know, maybe it could have went back to incubation, right? Coming from an archive back to incubation, um, depending on whether or not it met the criteria of incubation. So I think there's there's this desire or need for people to really understand what the status of a project is. And in addition to be able to help projects when they're starting to lose that momentum, to, to bring that momentum back to those projects. Marcus? Well, I mean, I really like this uh, the simplified view of this life cycle here. And I mean, what, what you're trying, um, Basically, to I mean, add back to to this um, graph is essentially uh, I mean some kind of meta states, right? I mean, I can imagine that I mean just in addition to that, I mean without changing the life cycle graph, the new one here, I mean you can basically assign I don't know a color to the uh, graduated state, like red flag saying, okay, something is wrong here. We don't have enough organizations working on contributing to this project. Yellow is, I don't know, something in the middle and green, everything is good. And then we could report, okay, uh, the following projects, uh, graduated projects are um, the following and uh, everyone is in a green state or uh, attention. One of the projects is currently, yeah, not so well. But still, some people are working on it, and uh, without putting it back to incubation mode, I mean, there's always still the chance that uh, since it's graduated already, it might attract other organizations to join in. All right. Thanks, Marcus. Arno. Yeah. So I I don't know that changing the label is what's going to make people you know, pay more attention and want to contribute from that point of view, you know, I'm not sure whether, yeah. you know, I think we want to more properly reflect what's going on in the project and allow this. Adding one arrow, I think doesn't complicate, over complicate the diagram, even though I really like the simplicity of what I came up with. Uh, I think it would then be too destructive to add an hour back from graduated to incubation. Okay, Peter? To me, it sounds like what the board is looking for is a health check that is uh, more expressive than the current health check that we have, at least in my mind, currently the health check is the quarterly reports. So to me, it sounds like however we configure the arrows and the boxes and the labels on this diagram won't really be enough because there was one key thing that was mentioned that we want to be able to catch the state change when it begins as in when the existing maintainers start to lose interest and they don't have time or 
or anything else that has prevented them from actually being uh, fully dedicated to it as they were before. And uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, a different level of granularity of a view that uh, it requires compared to the state diagram. So what I would think about is breaking off this conversation into two parts. One is the diagram, which is fairly high level, and it kind of just represents the end conclusions of longer periods of decision making. Whereas the health check, the one that captures the leading edge, the come up of, of these processes where where project uh, starts to be a little bit dormant. That's uh that could be a different process. Yeah, and I think that's part of what's been happening in the badging uh life cycle task force. So um you know I have a feeling that this isn't the end of this discussion, obviously, if we move forward with this. So um completely agree, Peter. Yakov, welcome. Um Happy to have you here and would love to hear what you've got to say about this. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, actually, so Marcos, I think mentioned that what if graduated could have uh, colors or something, right? Yep. So I think similarly, but uh, a bit more um, um, intensely in, 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 the, in the fact, in the sense that <clears throat> Only having graduated doesn't let us distinguish between projects which have, uh, for example, they are graduated by, but um, heavy development is, is being ongoing. There are still, uh, there are still uh, lots of things being shaped. Uh, think, for example, fabric version 1.2 until fabric version 1.4, lots of features were added, uh, but think, it's another um, um, alternative universe where, for example, fabric is graduated, but uh, for example, no development has been done in the last several years, right? I think we also had uh, some certain years uh, like that in fabric. So in my opinion, it should be uh, better if we, can, if we can distinguish between, distinguish between graduated and dormant, but I'm not sure that Dormant is the best word describing. Maybe we can pick two words for graduate and then dormant that would reflect um, the amount of activity in the project. Yeah, and I think this is Rama's second point um, that he was uh, bringing up. So Rama. Yeah, uh, exactly. That's, that's what I was going to say. Also, just going to quickly add to what Yakov said, uh, the a project i mean uh, yakov i think uh, uh, if a project is uh, a project can still be maintained without adding new features right i mean if if you see a constant stream of bug fixes that means that people are still working on the project so it doesn't necessarily have to be just a feature new feature development right that would still cause uh, that would still mean that the project can remain in a graduate state because people are actively maintaining it Any thoughts on that? So I, you know, this is how we got to where what we have today is, you yeah. know, we wanted to <laughs> to try to capture every possible case. And the downside is it makes for a pretty complicated uh, life cycle. I think, you know, the kind of situations you guys are talking about can be addressed in other ways. And, you know, there's a balance. I mean, you know, you can think of this as, you know, you could say, forget all of this, this is going too fast. And I did mention that in the comment, by the way, because I was like, okay, this is maybe too radical of a change. You know, the 
the simplest change is to change end of life to archive so you can resurrect a project. But then you add a bunch of arrows back and you're like, oh my God, how is that making things simpler? So that's why I said, well, you know, next you could say, well, do we really need deprecated? This can be handled by having the proper, you know, text on the readme page of the project in the main repo to say, hey, be careful, you know, and dormant is similar. It's like we could, the talk, right? We have right access to every, uh, the admins uh, have right access to every repo. If something is dormant, we can go put the, at the top of the readme, watch out, this, you know, this repo has not been active for some, some, uh, so much time, right? And so my point is, I, you know, I hear some of the, the I, and I think they are valid, huh? don't get me wrong. I think this is valid that there is a lot of subtlety we might want to convey. I just don't think that having a different state for every possible use, you know, situation a project can be in is necessarily the right way to communicate that. So um, I'm going to jump in before you do, Stephen, because I have a very radical um, thought here. What if our life cycle was proposal, project, archived, and then in project, we had a bunch of badges that we would assign to those projects so that people could really understand the state of the project. Um, while you noodle on that one, let's see what Stephen has to say. Thank you, Tracy. Now I don't feel so radical anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think that's really, I, I mean, I think part of what we're saying here is what the badges are trying to accomplish is a more nuanced view of the, of the, of the project, uh, the state within the project. So I think that's a good thing. Yes. Um, I think the, I think it does make sense to have a post graduated state um, I agree it doesn't need to have two dormant and deprecated, but I think it's useful to have one state between graduated and end of life that says, that basically says to the world, hey, um, something has changed here such that the existing maintainers cannot continue. If you are interested in this, you better jump in. And, and it gives a message that allows for um, um, ahead of ahead of end of lifing it or archiving it, which I think I see as the same thing, um, a heads up that those that are really interested could make an effort to continue it. Um, what I, I all I think uh, so very similar to what um, uh, Arno has, except adding, there's no path back from end of life, um, but there is an, you know, there is a state in between, whatever you want to call it, um, where it can be done. If anyone wants to take an end of life project and revive it, it comes back to, you know, it's a new project as far as anyone's concerned. So I don't think that really matters, but I think sending the message to the, to the ecosystem, Hey, um, the existing maintainers aren't going to work on it anymore. If anyone wants to take over or if anyone wants to take action, do so now. Um, otherwise, we're going to move this to end of life. Um, that, that all said, I think the, um, the incubation versus graduated, I'm open to that, Tracy. And um, the badges, I think, is what, what is being looked for um, generally. Uh, I think the the nuanced um, traffic light on a on a series of of attributes of a of a project or what they're looking for versus the quarterly reports. All right, thanks, Stephen. Peter. I uh, just a random thought about what Trace and Arno said. Do you have badges? for the graduated projects. Uh, first thing, I agree. Second, because when I heard all of that being said, what came to my mind is that maybe 
we should have the badging figured out and then uh, make that part of this picture so that we can discuss in earnest what information would be possible to be represented and graduated because right now everyone's going off a little bit on hypotheticals of but what if what if, what if this what if that and we could more definitely or definitively discuss those edge cases and hypotheticals if we already had the badging figured out or at least uh, to a current state where we can vote on it and then it would be a part of this in the sense that half of the questions that we ask ourselves now would be just implicitly answered by oh look there's that badge there's this and that's how that would work all right thank you rama yeah, I was uh, trying to. I was thinking there's a way to reconcile the two uh, variations from the diagram we've been discussing. One is uh, demotion of graduation to incubation, another adding an intermediate state between graduate and archive. Uh, I mean, if we just if we don't add another state, and if we just add the graduated to incubation state, uh, what what we can uh, say there is. Uh, Anytime a graduated project slips in whatever way, we just demote it back to incubation. And if project cannot even meet the minimum criteria for an incubated project, we just archive it. So I think uh, that will save us the trouble of trying to come up with a name, a new name for a for an intermediate state between graduated and archive. And it will also uh, fulfill the the goal of uh, telling maintainers of graduated project that they have slipped in standard. Yeah. Also on separately on your radical proposal, personally, I I prefer this, I think I would say, at least if I had to <laughs> vote on it, I, I like uh, a clear distinction between incubated and graduated. So. All right, thanks Rama. Oh, no. Yeah, just one quick comment slash question is like, you know, I, I realize when you guys are talking, you know, it, uh, some of you clearly have more faith in the value of those states in communicating to the, you know, world out there uh, than I do. And I don't know whether you're right or, or I, <laughs> my assumptions are right or wrong. I, it'd be interesting if people have some information in this regard. How many people out there who are not part of the hyperledger community depend on this stage you know, on this state, whether it's a project is labeled as graduated incubation or whatnot, to 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 decide on anything, I honestly don't know. I my my mental model, honestly, was you know, if people are going to go to the repo and they're going to see, oh, this is there is some readme that says we are a graduated project or we are, in, you know, there is a dormant state because nothing is happening. But I may be wrong. This may still have some value. I, I so I just wanted to share that because I think it does kind of, you know, depending on the way you answer that question, it does have an impact on whether this is important or not. Yeah, uh, Arno, I know at some point I have heard people actually say, well, that's not a graduated project, so I won't use it. Right. Um, which then implies that these things have meaning, which is why in my mind, maybe the right step is my radical approach. Uh, but yeah, well, well, I mean, we're not there yet, I guess. Bobby? Hi, Tracy. Thank you. Um, Arno, I love the simplified uh, view. I cannot wait to put it in the edX course once we vote on it. <laughs> Hopefully it will pass. Uh, my question more is uh, with the badging. Who's going to be responsible for updating those traffic lights? And is it the TOC? Is it the maintainers? Do the maintainers know that? Would they have to be trained on that? Or is it the staff at Hyperledger? Like, how do you see that badging actually working, uh, moving forward with the projects? Like, who would be responsible for that? Yeah, so, Bobby, one of the things that we've been discussing in the badging life cycle task force is what badges can be automated so that we don't have to have somebody who's responsible for this 
Um, we have found that there are certain badges that can be automated, but there are certain things that cannot be automated. And so, you know, the, the, your question is a good one. Um, part of what we've talked about is the maintainers requesting that badge um, that is not automatable, if you will. But uh, yeah, I don't think we've necessarily come to any great answers on that yet. But um, that's at least the current thinking. Rama, did I get that right? Yep, I think that's accurate. Okay. All right, so we've spent a good portion of time talking about this. Do we want to vote on this? Are we ready to vote on this? Are we wanting to take this back to the the drawing board and, and play with it some more? What's what's the current thinking? Anybody who thinks we're not ready to vote for this, let's start there. Well, Quick I feel question. like oh. there are different options that have been discussed and I, I don't know that this is the simple yes or no. Okay, Stephen. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I was going to ask, is part of the, the badges um, working group considering the state as well? Is that part of their mandate? Rama? Uh, can you just create uh, slight variations of this diagram based on the options we've discussed and then ask people to vote on the choices? Yes. Sure, we could do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a good idea. Even, yeah, I think uh, we have been somewhat discussing that in the badging life cycle. I don't think we've necessarily come to any sort of conclusions, but uh, yeah, we can definitely take and create some different options and have a discussion, a further discussion on this. Everyone uh, warm up your... Yeah, ahead, I please. think that's a better way to proceed in it. Even you were going to say? Everyone warm up your graph making skills. You can, <laughs> we can do this. Well, I, I don't know. Is this something that you want to take? Is this something you want me to take? What do you, what's the, what's the idea? Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many you, variations you guys want. That's the problem. So, so I have heard. Uh, I think the arrow back I can. I I've can got, do that, I've got the, Yeah. Okay. I've got that variation. I've got your variation. I've got one that is my radical variation. I've got one that's a variation that has um, a fixed state in it uh, between graduated and archived. Those are the variations that I've heard. So if it's just doing the graphics, not updating, like you're know, making four yeah. different PRs, I, I, yeah, I can play with the graphics. I, started to learn this graph these thing which is kind <laughs> of interesting to say the least all right sometimes well, you we'll, come up we'll with some you... weird looking arrows and stuff but yes, i can play yes. a bit more with this <laughs> all right we'll let you play with that um and come back to us with the the different options and then we can discuss okay thank you arno all right um so the next item on our agenda uh is dave uh your particular item on the hyperledger fabric ecosystem do you want to do that today uh yeah i think we can do it in 15 minutes at least get a good start on it i can okay. go ahead and share yep and then we can uh take a look at the retrospective next week Okay, so this ecosystem is something we created for the member summit and we discussed there. The I think one of the main objectives was to help people coming to the community figure out what the ecosystem is. So they would come into the community and they'd start asking around and they would eventually find there was a set of projects, a set of sub projects, a set of labs. And it was a, a fairly long list and it still is. We've archived a few of them, but it's still a pretty big list. And so the idea is uh, having a curated list. So the curated is the key word here. 
and that raises some questions, you know, like curated by who and under what criteria. And we can come to that at the end, uh, I guess. But I, I first wanted to kind of demonstrate what we came up with um, coming into the member summit and at the member summit. Um, so what we decided to do was break it into several areas. Um, one for like getting started for new people coming in. Uh, one for uh, application of view of the projects one that was a um, deployment and specifically Docker-based deployment view of the projects, one that was a Kubernetes or a production uh, view of the projects, and then management and operations uh, projects that could be related to either the Docker or the Kubernetes deployments, so they're agnostic to the deployment environments. And I think this is a good way um, to frame it. I won't go through each and every one of these, um, but I will say that they um, like, let's zoom in on the application one. Uh, it does take a pass at, across projects, sub projects and labs. Uh, again, these are the active um, projects that I would say the maintainers, I don't know if I wanna put the word recommend out there, uh, but it's definitely the active um, list. So we can see there's like the SDKs, we've indicated that the legacy SDKs are deprecated. And now if you're building an application SDK, that the recommendation would be, to, would be to use the new Fabric Gateway SDKs. So we've got the SDK, the application SDKs, the chain codes, uh, a few other things like this HLF connector that, that seemed fairly interesting and active that exposed uh, chain codes via REST service or Kafka messaging. And then we also have what I would call application frameworks. So these are things like Firefly, um, the smart client and the token SDK. Uh, and then finally under the applications uh, space, we have Cacti, uh, which, dem which showcases that you can interop um, between Fabric and other DLTs such as Besu and Corda. Uh, let's see, so I could, now that I've given you an overview, I can we can open it up for any initial comments or questions before I drill into the other, other parts. Uh, David has his hand raised. Just one quick comment, Dave. Thank you very much for putting this together. I mean, I was at that member summit session, so I can just share a couple observations. I think this is very, very useful for a variety of reasons. But one, I was really interested in that session to realize that even people who have been in the community for a fairly long time didn't even know about most, many of the things on here. So I think just making that curated list and raising the visibility is incredibly helpful. Uh, um, I mean, the, there's a lot going on in labs, for example, and it's hard to really know everything that's there. And, you know, you'd have to do a lot of digging to find all this stuff on your own. And so, you know, I think it's very useful for that. And so, and we also heard from people who have just recently started getting, um, going with Fabric. And when they have found some of these things on here, you know, they said it was very helpful. Like it shaved days off, you know, work they had to do, you know, finding some of these tools. So I think just raising the visibility is very helpful. And so thank you, Dave, for putting this together. And this might be help. this sort of an ecosystem mapping might be helpful, you know, for other parts of the Hyperledger community as well. So this is a great model, I think, for others to look at. Okay, thanks, David. Other early comments? Okay, so let me keep going. I can talk a little bit about the Docker and Kubernetes uh, views of this. Um, so several of the projects out there were Docker-based uh, ways to bring up a fabric network. Um, there was, in this area, there's probably the most overlap between the projects. And we've settled some of that by archiving some of the projects, uh, like Minifab used to be on this list, but now it's off. I forget if we've actually ar formally archived that project, but it definitely has not been active in the past year. So if it's not archived, archived officially, I think that's a good direction to go. Um, and then we, we have the opportunity here to highlight some of the differences between these different things. So Microfab um, is a single Docker container, which whereas the other ones, I say end containers, it just means there's multiple containers in a network. And the, the ramification here is that you can use Microfab for um, development environments. So if you're developing chain code, and you don't really care about all the 
pieces and managing all the pieces, this is a good one to use. It's a, it's a single container and you can easily bring up uh, deploy and test chain code with this. Uh, whereas the other ones, there's multiple containers and there's different things you might want to do. So if you're just wanting to play around with fabric concepts, understand fabric concepts and play with the tutorials and samples, you would probably use the test network. Um, but if you want to bring up uh, your own network with your own set of organizations and see how that works, you might use Fablo because here you can specify a network, specify the organizations, and it'll spin up the Docker Compose network. Uh, whereas with Cello, it also supports end containers and also supports the deployment to Docker Swarm. So I say, the, uh, I put the words development and test here lightly because you could use this in a production environment with Docker Swarm, in fact. Uh, but there is some overlap here. I think we still, I talked to David about this. We probably still want to figure out, maybe talk to the Fablo maintainers and the Cello maintainers and see if there's uh, enough difference to keep both of these or if they could collaborate and combine efforts uh, and, and bring these projects together to make it a little bit even more obvious to people which ones to use. And then the other thing I'll highlight is that you can use things like the Blockchain Explorer, the Operations Council, and the, the Ops System Chain Code. Uh, depending, regardless of the deployment. So you'll see the same names of projects here on the Kubernetes view. So the main thing I want to highlight on the Kubernetes view are the, is the two pink projects. Those are the two uh, main Kubernetes, Kubernetes operators for Fabric. So there's the Bevel operator for Fabric that obviously works with the Bevel deployment framework. And then there's the Fabric operator that doesn't work with Bevel, um, but it powers the IBM blockchain platform that people might be aware of that. And so wanted to clue people in which one that is. Uh, but again, the other management op management uh, utilities like the Explorer and the Ops System Chain Code uh, can work with either of these. Um, do highlight that the what's called the Fabric Ansible Collection uh, will help you deploy the Fabric Operator in the Operations Console. Uh, and then down below, we have the projects that are what I could say are agnostic to deployment environments. So the Ops Console, the Admin SDK, the Operations Smart Contract, and the Blockchain Explorer can really be used with any type of uh, fabric deployment. So I think it really does help um, people get a mental framework of what the, what the different projects are, where they sit, what, what they might be used for. Um, and then I guess the point I wanted to come back to at the end here, if there's other, if there's no other comments, is this this idea of a curated list. So, who, who could best curate this going forward? Uh, is it, you know, anybody? I mean, theoretically, anybody can come here on the wiki and add their own favorite project, even if it's not that active. So, do we want to have the project maintainers kind of keep an eye on this, uh, and what criteria should we utilize? So, you know, I don't mind doing this um, in my free time, if that's the decision, um, but I also wanted to leave it up for discussion here of whether we wanted to have a more formalized approach. And if we do this for other projects, you know, how, how might they do, make these decisions? Yeah, so Dave, I have a, a comment, I guess, on the Kubernetes piece. Um, sure. You have Bevel Operator Fabric, but you don't have Hyperledger Bevel as a mechanism to deploy um the the fabric network uh to kubernetes right without using the operator per se so i i don't know how that fits in here but uh oh so you, i didn't even know that was an option that. so you can use bevel without the bevel operator yes at least you could i think that's still the case we should probably check with sonac but i'm pretty sure that's still the case that's right Okay, you just wrecked my mental model. We'll have to figure out how to, uh, how, to how to squeeze that <laughs> yeah, in here. It, I think it, you know, is that the management applications? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway. But but least, yeah, that's uh, one of the points here is for the for these gaps that we identify, we can figure out how to deal with that. So I can talk to Sonac. Yeah, sounds good. Um, and yeah, as far as who curates it, I I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Um, you know, obviously there's somebody who needs to be aware of everything that's going on in the fabric ecosystem and that could potentially be a challenge, um, right? I Obviously it took a while to get here. So um, 
it's it's interesting to try and figure out who knows what. Maybe there's a set of people in the fabric um, area that can be um, part of the curators and then people come to you and say like, hey, I've got this. And then you have a conversation about what it is and the status of it and where it fits. I don't know. Any other ideas from anybody? Yeah, having to be a community effort makes sense. I mean, I wouldn't, I would hesitate to call it like a task force or something, but maybe there's some sort of a shared ownership model here. It, it'd be hard for one person to know everything, I think. So, you know, having a group of people around this would be great. Marcus? Yeah, I think this is a great list. Um, I mean, you see those lists on, on GitHub quite often. I don't know, awesome list uh, X, awesome list uh, Z, right? Which is essentially the same concept. Um, and I think, I mean, um, I don't think that the one, the person or the, the group of people maintaining this list, that they need to have always um, the, the complete overview of the entire ecosystem, what's going on there and go actively in searching for new things. But so what maybe this list that should also contain some in the end, um, the, describing in one paragraph, the way how to contribute new project to this list. And then the maintainers receive, I don't know, a pull request, an email or whatever they can review and then add uh, a new, um, Project to this list. Okay, and that kind of gets to the other question about where to keep this. Is do people think this is good on the wiki? I know we're trying to maybe phase out the wiki over time and move everything to GitHub. Um, and at least when we were creating this, it was good to have a space that we could collaborate easily, um, a little bit more easier than than pull requests. But maybe this should go to GitHub, but then the question is which project, like we tried to keep Fabric Core scope to Fabric Core and not all these other things. Um, and then there's things like the governance GitHub and TOC GitHub. I didn't know if it made sense there either. Yeah, so in my opinion, um, I don't see why this should go into GitHub or at least we're not clear on which repository. I also would, would like to say that uh, while this list seems uh, very nice, uh, and I mean, obviously they've invested uh, a substantial amount of work making it, I think uh, um, there is one, one, one problem in, in, in the list, and that is we're not sure, or at least uh, it's not written here, the maturity level and the maintenance level of all of these projects because if we put on such a list on, on some official public website then people might might assume that okay all projects here are maintained uh, they are supported if i <clears throat> ask about them uh, on discord or uh, on github uh, i will get some answers and help which is not the case because i i know for that at least some of the projects here the people uh, that, that work on them, they're long gone. So I think we should add, um, we should add or at least track each, each if we are putting such a list, we, we, should, we should then do uh, due do, do, do diligence and, and, and track for each project um, its, level, its level of support and um, maturity. Right, that's the challenge. At the end of the day, if we have a, a subset list like this that's curated, it's going to be basically an opinion, whether that's an opinion of, of one person like me or uh, a, a committee or a group of people like the maintainers. Um, we can figure that out. But yeah, that is the main challenge. Um, what's the criteria for things getting on this list or falling off this list? I tried to do a cut you know, based on project activity. So I looked at commits, like some of the uh, projects that I wasn't quite familiar with. I looked at the commits and if there was commits, you know, in a lot of the months this year, I put it on the list. If there wasn't, I excluded from the list. Um, 
but yeah, that'll that'll be the main challenge of how to keeping how to keep this up to date going forward. Okay, um, so that sounds like a further discussion that we need to have. I do see that we are over time, um, so I want to make sure that we're respectful of people's time. But thank you, Dave, for presenting this. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the great conversation today. I'm looking forward to continuing these conversations uh, next week and into next year. So we will see you again next week. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Tracy.